So as Edward said, my name is Corinne Dutlison. I'm uh, a professor in the philosophy department with a secondary appointment in the Graduate School of Education here at Penn. Um, and I'll be teaching a tip seminar in the spring, which is my fourth tip seminar. I was also really lucky to be able to attend uh, the Yale National Initiative a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, which uh, some of you were, were there as well. Uh, and I learned a lot from watching expert teachers there do their thing. So I'm gonna share my screen. I have a very uh, brief uh, PowerPoint or keynote. Um, so I'm really interested in philosophy in, in general about what seems to me to be a pull between democratic impulses on the one hand and uh, the idea of expertise on the other. I think uh, uh, democracy and expertise, um, each of those have really positive connotations. So for example, uh, the positive side of democracy is that uh, the democratic impulse is an impulse that accommodates lots of points of view, lots of perspectives. It's an impulse that allows people to have a say in their living conditions, whether those living conditions be within a state or within a family or within um, any sort of community. Uh, and expertise also, uh, one, has, um, one can, can understand the positive side of expertise. Uh, for example, uh, if one relies upon expertise, one is relying upon cutting edge leading knowledge in order to be able to make decisions and in order to be able to take action. Um, and uh, this can have the result of uh, action and decisions that are being based on solid evidence um, and therefore um, being good decisions and good actions. But there are also dangers associated with each of democracy and expertise, and they can conflict with one another as well. And it's that conflict zone between the two and the possible dangers of these two uh, oftentimes positive impulses that I find really interesting. So I want to talk through a few cases uh, just to give you an example of how I see these um, conflicts and the, the dangers arriving. Um, uh, arising out of democracy and expertise. And, and I'll start with an example from science, specifically from medicine, and in particular, a uh, case of uh, cardiovascular disease. So if one were to suffer from cardiovascular disease, then one would no doubt uh, prefer to have an expert to be the person treating um, themselves. That is, I think very few of us would decide that we would want to have some kind of democratic discussion with a bunch of people sitting around the table, maybe a plumber, a hedge fund manager, a high school student, an astrophysicist, a barber, all deciding what uh, my treatment would be. Uh, what we want in a case like that is an expert to treat us. And that's the positive side of expertise. But if you um, look over the long history of science, um, including the science of diseases, such as, for example, cardiovascular disease, um, we see oftentimes a downside of expertise, and that is the kind of gatekeeping um, that can keep out various views on medicine and disease. So for example, if the gatekeepers, those who have expertise in an area, have a limited view of their subjects, for example, if they take the typical subject to be, for example, a white man, and this has often been the case in the history of science and the history of medicine, then um, those experts ignore the very specific ways in which cardiovascular disease can affect, for example, women or people of color. Um, and here one might think that having some kind of democracy, perhaps a democracy of medical experts, would be um, a good way of getting a wider demographic than has historically obtained when uh, folks study um, uh, diseases, for example, cardiovascular disease. And you get examples of this kind of pull between expertise and democracy and science all the time. I think there's also another interesting um, correlate to this poll, and that is, uh, uh, looking at that, at, at these kinds of cases, uh, problematizes what we tend to think of as a very bright line between, on the one hand, 
facts and science, uh, the empirical, and on the other hand, uh, values, ethics, and the normative. In fact, I think that supposed bright line is not nearly as bright as um, we tend to think it is. That the values, the normative commitments that scientists, for example, have infect the um, pursuit of science all the time. And the example I just gave you is one example. Moving on to uh, history, um, we might think about what might be some of the egregious misuses of history um, and the telling of our past that, that we've come across. And, and a really clear example of this, an example that's, uh, that, that's brought up a lot is um, the, uh, the denial of the Holocaust. And there are plenty of examples like this, including many examples from with, uh, within historical accounts given, um, uh, sorry, of the historical accounts given uh, within the history of the United States as well. And once again here, one might think, well, the obvious solution to uh, these egregious misuses of history would be to call upon expertise. So for example, the, the expertise of historians who have been trained to understand what counts as historical evidence and why some pieces of so-called evidence uh, don't count um, as giving us a true account of the past. So for example, so-called evidence that leads some folks to deny that the Holocaust ever happened. Um, that is uh, expert training in the practice of history is seen as key. Um, again, uh, um, um, one might think that one doesn't want to open up the discussion of whether or not the, uh, the Holocaust did or didn't happen to the democratic decision making of a range of people, which might uh, include Holocaust deniers, but again, the issue of gatekeeping uh, and over the overreach of gatekeeping that could um, occur in, uh, in a space that draws from a limited range of perspectives and voices can cause or can po pose concerns when it comes to expertise. And here I think there was a really uh, interesting series of movements in the mid 20th century that, were, that, that, that followed a democratic impulse to include the perspectives of peoples whose stories had been overlooked in much of history. Um, so for example, uh, micro history or history from below became a very uh, powerful movements in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, people looking at, for example, what was happening in the marketplaces with, uh, uh, with just ordinary folk, what kinds of things were happening with families in their kitchens, what were happening, for example, in local churches. And here the thought was, to get the histories of ordinary people whose names we've never learned somehow out into the historical record would give us a fuller, more complete understanding of our past. And that um, is, uh, once again, comes from a kind of democratic impulse. Literature um, enters into this struggle between expertise and democracy, I think in, in a different kind of way, but also really interesting. And to see one way in which literature um, enters into this discussion, uh, I think it's helpful to look at one of the philosopher's favorite topics, and that's the topic of truth. And related to that, uh, what it means for something to be a fact. And the idea of truth has been in the background of the discussions that, um, uh, or the, the discussion that I've, I've had so far. Uh, so for example, by expertise acting as the gatekeepers, um, with regard to, for example, cardiovascular disease, or uh, with respect to what counts as evidence, what they're trying to lock into is the truth of the matter with respect to uh, how hearts work, or the truth of the matter with respect to what the past is like. And so it seems that truth may be a crucial um, way of entering into uh, this tension between expertise and democracy, that there's something good about expertise, there's something good about democracy, but whatever we say, what we should be aiming for is the truth. But literature here, I think, encourages us to be wary on this front too. And I'm thinking particularly of fiction. Um, so uh, if you take fiction, 
uh, uh, there's no locking in of fiction with facts. That's exactly what fiction is supposed to be about, is a story that doesn't necessarily lock into what's factual. But nonetheless, I think that there's a not insignificant way in which one could say that there's real truthfulness. Truthfulness, say, about the human experience um, in fiction, despite the fact that uh, fiction does not um, connect in with uh, facts. Um, in interest of time, I think I'm going to move on um, to the last slide that I, I have here. Uh, our seminar, those of us who uh, will join the truth Oh, sorry, the democracy and expertise seminar in the in the spring uh, will play out something like fo uh, the following. We'll have some general readings and general discussion on the nature of expertise, on the nature and forms of democracy, and on um, uh, things that are related to the conception of truth. Uh, facts, evidence, um, and opinion, including one's unique perspective on the world with that unique perspective carrying truth with it. And then with this general reading, uh, these general readings and, and discussions under our belt, we'll then connect that with um, uh, various ways in which humans make sense of the world, science, history, literature, and dot, dot, dot. And the dot, dot, dot is meant to capture the idea that um, uh, whoever signs up for this seminar, I'll be in touch with you two to three weeks in advance to talk about what it is that you're hoping to get out of the seminar and collaboratively with uh, the fellows who are in the seminar, we will together make sure that we come up with a list of topics and a group of readings that will address everybody's concerns as, as fully as possible. So that's what our seminar will look like. I'm looking forward to the spring. The spring is that uh, cherry blossomed picture over there on the right, but to get there, we have to go through fall and winter and whatever that brings. Uh, I wish you all good luck. So thank you very much.